I'd like to uh, welcome you all uh, to this webinar. My name is Paul, Paul Boiting, and I chair Book Aid International. This is the third in the series uh, of webinars, Books Change Lives. Uh, the linchpin of the series has been Louisa, Louisa Simpson, founder of uh, Books and the Barn, and she's going to be interviewing, as she has done on two previous occasions, a distinguished guest, someone to whom books matter and who matters in books. And we couldn't be more fortunate uh, tonight than to have uh, David, David Nichols uh, with us, a best-selling author of One Day and Us, amongst many other things, uh, and someone to whom books certainly matter and who matters uh, in, in books. So a big thank you to uh, Louisa and David, but above all, a big thank you to you all, uh, our, uh, our donors, our friends at BookAid, uh, who make BookAid possible. Uh, ours is a charity that last year sent more than a million books where they were most needed. Um, BookAid provides uh, books for midwives uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, for nurses and clinicians in Uganda. Uh, as we speak uh, in an Africa which has been affected by COVID in terms of the closure of schools, we've been providing books uh, to schools uh, in, in Kenya. But those in some ways are easy places. We also provide books in the most difficult of circumstances. In the aftermath of hurricanes and climate change emergencies that have wiped out whole libraries, whole communities, in the course of conflict. And as we speak tonight, we are providing books to the southern and western, northwest and southwest Cameroon. And in Cameroon, only two weeks ago, in a village called Kumba in the southwest, uh, a region our partners in the Cameroon know well and work in, uh, there were eight children killed, more than a, a dozen uh, injured in an attack on a school. Uh, that follows other attacks on schools, on communities in the Southwest and Northwest Cameroon as a result of conflict between Anglophone and Francophone Cameroon. We provide books for those children, but not just in schools. Thanks to people like you, our donors, we're able to provide books in the forests in the Cameroon, where as we speak tonight, there will be 300,000 people heading down. And the children in those forests in the Cameroon have books, books in specially constructed boxes to make them explosion proof and weather proof. Books that literally the only connection those children have with any sort of normality. No government provides them with books. You provide them with books. So books for them are a lifeline, literally, for all of us in the course of this pandemic. Uh, they've been a lifeline, haven't they? Because we know books matter. But for those young people and for many others who are the victims of conflict, uh, books literally are a lifeline. So I want to say a big thank you uh, to you and to say that thanks to you, Book Aid continues even in the pandemic to send books out to where they're most needed and where they will make a difference. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to uh, Louisa uh, and, to, and to David. So we learn how books matter to them, to you, to the wider world. Louisa, David. Paul, thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful and very eloquent and, and passionate introduction. And David, hello, it's uh, wonderful to have you. Welcome to Book Aid, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce you and chat to you for about 45 minutes and then uh, hope that all our participants of which are joining by the second, I can see from the bottom of my screen, 
Um, I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions that they would like to ask you. So the last 15 minutes will be asking you questions, if that's all right. Of course, of course. Okay. Um, so David is the best-selling author of Us, One Day, The Understudy, and Starter for Ten. His most recent novel is Sweet Sorrow. His novels have sold over 8 million copies worldwide and been translated into 40 languages. He's an award-winning screenwriter with TV credits ranging from Cold Feet to Much Ado About Nothing. He's also adapted several of the classics, including Tess and Great Expectations. He recently won a BAFTA for Patrick Mulrose, his adaptation of the novels of Edward St. Alban. David's fourth novel, Us, was longlisted for the Booker Prize when it was published six years ago and was also a number one bestseller, and, um, a source of envy, I'm sure, for his fellow novelists to be shortlisted for a big literary prize and to be a bestseller. He adapted it for the BBC and it was shown recently starring Tom Hollander. David, welcome. It's lovely to have you. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. I'm going to stop playing with my hair. It's been a long <laughs> time since I had a haircut. And you can I play with your <laughs> you play with your hair. Away. That's absolutely fine. Um, now we know you as a highly successful uh, screenwriter, but before this, a brief acting career. Um, I wanted to ask yeah. you, how did the transition from actor to writer come about? It wasn't brief enough, unfortunately. It was eight years of <laughs> standing around, not saying very much. Um, I, uh, I I left university not quite sure, not knowing what I was going to do. I didn't really know whether I was going to be an academic or a teacher. And I'd love being in plays, and I wanted to stay. I suppose prolong that experience of being in productions and putting on plays and. I, I certainly didn't think I'd be a writer, so that idea wasn't even in my head, but I, 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 um, I did a bit of training and then I got small parts in theatre for years and years. I did a lot of fringe theatre, some rep, and then I, I was at the National Theatre for a long time. My first job at the National Theatre was an, an understudy in uh, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia the very first production. So I got to sit in the room and see this play come together and I didn't get to do any acting. I didn't go anywhere near the stage, uh, but I was there, you know, a kind of um, like a sort of fire extinguisher in case something went really badly wrong. They'd bring me on and it never happened. And so I spent a long time, you know, like a lot of actors, without very much to do. And I started reading scripts for theatre companies, TV companies, film companies. And then a friend of mine who was pretty convinced that I wasn't cut out to be an actor, tried to push me towards writing and asked me to co-write a screenplay with him based on the Sam Shepard play. We were both big Sam Shepard fans when we were at university. So we had a meeting with Sam Shepard and got permission to write this script. And that was my first screenwriting credit. Uh, it got made, it was called Sympatico with Jeff Bridges and Albert Finney and Sharon Stone. And I'd never really written anything at all before. So I fell into it really through script editing rather than script writing. You know, there was nothing in this big Hollywood film that was me, was my experience. It was really just that I, I had a better idea than my friend Matthew of how to construct a scene and uh, how to open up a play and, and how to type. And I had a computer. And so I, I over the course of several years, we wrote this screenplay. And then I, I kind of was forced out of acting. I was still playing small parts during that eight year period, but I, the work dried up. My parts were actually getting smaller rather than bigger. I was being asked to do less and less. So it wasn't, I, I, my hope was that the National Theatre would be like the civil service and you'd kind of, you know, you'd work your way up to actually speaking and moving. Uh, but I never got there. And so I, I, I told myself that if it wasn't happening by the time I was 30, I would stop. And when I was 29, I gave it up and moved into script editing. I worked in BBC Radio for a while and then television. And then uh, eventually, once I had two or three of my own scripts, I made the move into writing full time, but not until I was 31. And my big break was Cold Feet. I joined the writing team on Cold Feet on the third series, and that was my big break. God, I think that's obviously there'll probably be, I think there'll be quite a lot of younger people watching in the audience. That's tremendously refreshing to hear that actually you didn't really find what you wanted to do until you were 31. Yeah. They should just keep going. That's that's great. Um, so you became, th then you started writing novels and you became an absolute household name after the phenomenon of, of One Day, the yeah. novel that sold five million copies. 
and was later turned into a film when Anne Hathaway and Jim Sturgis. What was the inspiration for this love for the love story? Well, I was, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I suppose the first thing to say is I went into fiction because the screenwriting work dried up. You know, I, I, I had a couple of my own shows after Cold Feet that didn't quite work out. And so suddenly I had no outlet to, to write what I wanted to write, which was at that stage, I wanted to write about university and university experience, which had been very important to me. And that became a novel that became start of a 10. And then uh, the second novel, The Understudy didn't do so well. So I had to have a little rethink and I had to have, I had a little break during which time I wrote uh, the BBC adaptation of Tess of the D'Urbervilles with Eddie Redmayne and Gemma Arterton. And I was sat reading that book one day and I came across a particular passage. I don't think this is a spoiler, but a, a little passage where Tess looks in the mirror and, and wonders if the, that particular day has a significance of which she is not yet aware, that whether within each year there's a kind of hidden day that we pass through unaware, an anniversary of events yet to come. And I thought this was an amazing idea. Wouldn't it be great to write a story set on this one particular day every year without telling the reader why? And that was the root of it, really, to do a love story, but instead of, you know, doing the main events, the first kiss and the first meeting and the, the breakup, and, you know, instead of uh, the wedding, instead of doing the familiar events, do an ordinary day and do a series of snapshots, 20 snapshots to tell the story of a relationship. And that sort of spun out into one day. And I was really, I thought it seemed like a good idea. I didn't think anyone had done it. It was a, what they call a high concept. And I really loved writing it. No one was waiting for that third novel, you know, because my second novel hadn't done that well. And so um, it, it, I, I took my time and loved writing it. And that was the third book. Incredible. Incredible. And then five million copies. It, I mean, after writing that and those huge success it was, and then, and then how did the film sort of evolve? Did the film rights come very quickly because of the sale? Yeah. They came actually before it was a bestseller. So they came when it hadn't it barely been published outside the UK, it was still in hardback in the UK. It probably happened a little too soon, to be honest, it, because suddenly we were, we were making it just as it was taking off around the world. So there's that formidable challenge of, you know, suddenly everyone looking over your shoulder and, uh, and, and, and this terrific responsibility to, 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 uh, to capture everything in the book into, you know, cram it all into a, a hundred minutes, which is excruciating. So I, I loved the experience of the book coming out, but to be plunged straight into the experience of making the film was really hard you know there was no breather at all for for a good three or four years after after the novel came out and uh, it was particularly hard to think about writing another novel you know it took me a long time to stop talking about Emma and Dexter because I was on a sort of publicity tour for three years which is lovely and 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 certainly not anything I'd complain about at any point I mean it was what every writer dreams of but it did make writing very very hard for a while Interesting. God, three or four years. Wow. So when you've talked about adapting Tess, obviously yeah. alongside writing novels, you've worked on some powerful screen adaptations from Tess and Great Expectations to Far From the Madding Crowd. And as you like it, could you talk a little bit of about adapting? Do you feel a huge sense of responsibility when adapting them or is there a freedom in putting your own spin on it? It depends on the brief. You know, I did a, a show for the BBC called Shakespeare Retold. It was much, much ado about nothing for, for that. And with that, you know, the responsibility was, was to take themes and ideas, but basically write an original screenplay that drew on Shakespeare's original. And I loved that. That was a really fun project, Damien Lewis and Sarah Parrish and, and uh, Olivia Coleman in a tiny part. And it was fun. And it the brief was, you know, draw as much as you can from the play, but have fun with it. But if I'm working on something like uh, Patrick Melrose, which I love, or Great Expectations, which is probably my favorite book, or Far From the Madding Crowd, which is, has been made before and made wonderfully, um, then you have a different set of responsibilities. You either have to do something new with the, the source material, or you have to try and convey what you love about the source material. I mean, with Patrick Melrose, my, my, my pep talk to myself really was, these books are extraordinary, how are you going to convey that to a whole new audience? In a way, something like Patrick Melrose is the ideal adaptation because 
the books are well known and, and much respected, but they could have a much, much broader appeal. How are you going to translate that? Um, and so I, uh, there are screenwriters who, you know, read the book once and throw it away. And, 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 and there's an, another myth that surrounds adaptation that, you know, good books don't make good screen versions, that actually the kind of, um, that often it's slightly more sensational fiction that makes wonderful cinema or television. And I can see an element of truth in that, but I've only ever adapted things that I love. And, and the mission has always been not absolute fidelity because it's not possible, you know, it's a different medium. The only way you could faithfully adapt a book is to, even if you sat and read it out loud to an audience, you'd still be giving your own interpretation, your own inflection. So it's always going to be a version of, and you always have to tell yourself the book is still there on the shelf. And when you make a film of it, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't, the text on the page doesn't change. So you are allowed to change certain things, to cut certain elements, to, to am amplify other elements. So it is an interpretation, but at the same time, I do want to faithfully convey what I love about the material as much as possible. So yes, I do feel a, a responsibility. I hate it when people say, um, it's not as good as the book. I don't mind people saying it's different to the book, but I'd, I'd like it to be as uh, as satisfying in a different way as the work of fiction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what do you feel about these people who's, who, are, who are perhaps a little academically snobbish and say, oh, it's terrible, you know, if you watch Little Dorrit, it's terrible if you watched on the screen before the book. Do you, do you think it doesn't matter how you come at a classic if you come via the screen? Um, to I, the I, I, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I got through my Middlemarch uh, tutorial in university from watching the Andrew Davis adaptation. <laughs> you know, I kind of, I'm not a snob about it at all. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting to watch those versions. I think the a book is always going to give you a different experience. Um, you know, a book, one of the great joys of making, putting something on screen is you can control time. You're trying to make the story work in the same way for everyone who is watching, because they're usually watching, you know, for an hour or for two and a half hours if it's a big film, or they're all watching together. They're going to be excited at the same time, laugh at the same time, cry at the same time. Even if they're in a room by themselves, you're trying to create a universal experience. The experience of reading a novel is incredibly subjective. You know, you're going to have your own version of the character's faces in your head. Different parts are going to make you laugh and cry. You're going to read it in a in an entirely different way to other people. You might read it in 10 minute installments. You might, might read it in a single sitting. You have no control over that as an author. But as a screenwriter or someone involved in, in screen production, you can play with that. Yeah. And it's a it's not a better or worse experience. It's a different experience. Um, I mean, I, I, for me, I, I feel tremendous love and pride and, uh, and, and, of, and reverence for the written word and for the experience of reading uh, individually. At the same time, it's great to hear people laugh in unison or to know that all over the country people are crying at the same thing at the same time. That's very exciting. So for me, that, that, that there is no, uh, there's no hierarchy in, in that experience. I grew up on books and films and television. And sometimes it was Dickens and sometimes it was Coronation Street. You know, it was all story and character and language to me. And, and, and for me, they're all jumbled up and, and, and I love them all. That's great to hear. I think a lot of teenagers will be using that using that now as, you know, it doesn't matter <laughs> if I watch Friends all the time because David Nicholson <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I am as influenced by, I am as influenced by sitcom as I am by, by uh, Tolstoy, you know, I kind yeah. of, I, I, it, all, it all goes in, it all, it yeah. all goes in and it all muddle, it's all part of the soup, um, yeah. it's all fuel. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, fantastic, okay. So, um, your novel Us was recently adapted by you for the BBC with, with Tom Hollander as, as the leading role as Douglas. Um, briefly, is that I'm sort of aware of time that the novel opens with Douglas's wife Connie played by Saskia Reeves saying she wants to leave her husband of many years and he tries to persuade her to stay and they embark on a tour of Europe with their 17 year old son and now Tom Holland has been praised for his portrayal of Douglas a character full of complexities how, how was it for you adapting your novel into into four hours of telly and you must feel like a, a butcher in some senses come curving up some of your 
work and how was he to work with sorry that's two two hander no, no, that's fine uh, it was very very hard because one of I, I, every book i read i have a, a a voice in my head which shouldn't really be there but is it, it is wondering how you might make this work on screen and one of the alarms that goes off it uh, well us contains two massive problems for a dramatist one is that it's an interior monologue so it's all one person's point of view and it's told by that person in a very distinctive voice and the voice that they think with is not the voice that they speak with so how are you going to get their internal thoughts which are very different from how they say and behave onto the screen uh you, the only way to do it is voiceover and voiceover is a very dangerous tool it's a very tricky thing to use it gets very boring it, it doesn't register in the same way as words on the page and the second problem is it's about people getting old it's the story of a marriage so it's over 25 years and uh, you can use different actors you can arrange them up with a novel you can cross fade between time and location in a very fluid way which you can't really with a with a um with a screenplay so it was very very hard and uh and it becomes a different thing because um uh with an, a first person voice if someone behaves like an idiot you can easily as a novelist say he, he wondered why he was behaving like an idiot or why am i saying this i don't mean it what i mean is this you lose that ability on screen and so what you have to rely on uh is the performance and you know in that respect I think Tom Hollander is an exceptional actor because he gives you pages and pages and pages of prose with a look or with a smile or with a shrug of his shoulders. You know, he does what actors, brilliant actors do. They provide an inner monologue. And of course you miss jokes and observations. You know, there's no rule in the screenplay for a memory or a, a simile or a, 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 a long passage of description. All of that goes when you adapt. But, um, what you get instead is the thrill of watching performance and all these other thrills as well. You get music and you get location, you get design, you get uh, the excitement that editing can provide. So you get a whole different set of um, assets. And for me, very high in that uh, list of, of, of exciting new elements is performance. And I think the cast with this were, were wonderful. So the pain of losing you know, good jokes or nice descriptions is is um is the joy of performance well he put in a fantastic performance and was he did you you say that you sometimes have people in your head when you're writing or put it onto the screen did you have him in mind was he your that's, no, I mean, I, I think was he your first choice but um he, how yeah, was it to work with him i'd always loved tom and i'd never i i don't i do think a lot about performance when i'm writing a novel you know often i think of a kind of an attitude or an energy that an actor provides but i don't it's never one specific actor all the way through you know that i couldn't secretly i don't secretly cast the novels yeah. because one hopes that the reader will do that and 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 um it's a private thing when you when you um put things on screen then suddenly you're trying to find a performance that it, it, that that matches your version and inevitably there are a range of actors who can do it but once you cast something well then that becomes the only performance it becomes the only actor you can imagine in that role and now if i ever do go back to the novel i think of tom you know which is what you you're looking for really in a, in a casting decision yeah it was absolutely fantastic and um, I thought fathers and sons, I thought the relationship between Albie and Douglas was done absolutely fantastically. I, I don't think your children are quite old enough for that relationship. They're a bit, I think Albie's a little older than your children, but it was done yeah. beautifully. Um, and the father-son relationship is a bit of a theme in your work with, with Sweet Sorrow and also in You Adapted and When Did You Last See Your Father, the Blake Morrison book. Yeah. Um, did the father-son sort of dynamic, because I sort of felt it changed from being a portrayal of a marriage more towards the father and the son relationship yeah. during well, the I, during the book during. Yeah, the I mean the the, the 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 sad truth is that uh, I had a I had the novel planned out and uh, you know the story was there. My father had started to become quite ill, and there's a point in the novel where um, Albie runs away and and Douglas sets off by himself to bring him back and I got to that point in the novel and my father passed away my father um my father died so I took some time off to to deal with that and when I went back to the novel I was suddenly writing a novel about a you know father's quest 
for his son and a, 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 a kind of dissertation on what it's like to be a, a good dad and, and, and what kind of father one ought to be and uh, a regret and uh, the lack of communication and all of those themes. You know, I, I, I was exploring all of that in the wake of my, my father's death. My father was nothing like uh, Douglas. I mean, he was almost deliberately the opposite of my, my own dad. But inevitably, some of my own uh, sadness and regret about that relationship found its way on the page in the way that it, your pre preoccupations inevitably do, even if you're not writing autobiographically. It would be very, um, even if you're writing science fiction or a detective novel, you're always going to return to the things that, that, that trouble you and, and preoccupy you and keep you awake at night, because that's what writing is. That's why you do it. And uh, certainly it wasn't in real life, it was a very different relationship, but it was also a, a relationship that was quite tricky. Yeah, it wasn't a very communicative relationship. Uh, right to the end, it wasn't. So I have a certain amount of regret about that, and it probably found its way onto the page, yeah. Interesting, interesting. And can you tell us, there's, there's quite a poignant scene where he gets stung by jellyfish. And I, I think that perhaps that is that there's an element of truth in that. Could you tell us a little? Did you have a similar? Yeah. Jellyfish. <laughs> I'm, I'm what's the phrase? Catnip. I'm catnip for jellyfish. I don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, that the, the, the thing of the, the, the scene where he suddenly swam out to sea and he's trying to lose some of the stress and tension and then is stung and then realizes between him and the shore is just a sea of jellyfish that that's all that's all true uh there's another scene in the novel where uh he knocks it isn't in the tv version because it's too hard to film to would have taken too much time in amsterdam but he knocks over a bike that knocks over another bike that knocks over a whole row of bikes that knocks over a motorcycle and that happened as well that happened uh in amsterdam uh in uh, a few years before I started writing the book. So yeah, I, 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 when bad things happen to you as a novelist, at least you have the consolation that it might make a, you know, a chapter. <laughs> and I try not to write autobiographically, but if I do find myself, you know, humiliated or, or hurt in some way, then, then it's, you know, it's material. It's so uh, that's a small consolation for the jellyfish attack, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you as brave as him? Or <laughs> Uh, no, I was very whiny about the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it really hurts. It really, really does hurt. I didn't like, unlike Douglas, I didn't have a heart attack and I didn't, it didn't lead to any particular bonding experience with my son. He was very <laughs> indifferent to the whole thing. But uh, <laughs> no, it did happen. <laughs> um, so moving on to, to Sweet Sorrow, which is your, yeah. your latest novel that came out earlier this year, and it's over my left. Or right shoulder, if, if the beautiful picture of the jacket, if anyone would like to buy it. Um, it's a story of first love and lost innocence set in the summer of 1997. Um, I absolutely loved it. You capture the boredom of teenage summers and the tremendous awkwardness and insecurities of first love as a teenage boy. Now, you wrote this in your 50s, a long time after your teens. And I wanted to know, was your teenage life similar to Charlie's? And how did you get into the zone? Did you keep a diary? What? I, uh, I, um, I, after us, I thought, well, I can't, I don't want to keep, I, I pretty much written characters who are roughly my age. And when I wrote us, Douglas was 10 years older than me. I'm Douglas's age now, but when I started writing, he was much, much older. I, I, and with the follow-up, I thought, I don't, I'm not quite ready to write the 60 something love story yet. I, I'd like to go back and write a different kind of love story. And first love has a kind of unique quality. You know, it only ever happens once and it's foolish and dizzying and it's like discovering a new sense or something. I mean, it's really overwhelming. And I, I wanted to try and capture that without writing autobiographically. So again, you know, you, you go in the opposite direction. Charlie and Sweet Sorrow, just very briefly for anyone who hasn't read it, it's about a kid who screws up his exams. He's a bit lost. He's not going to college. He doesn't know what he's going to do with his life. He meets a girl and she's playing Juliet in an Amdram production of Romeo and Juliet, a youth theatre production. And the only way he can see her is to join the production. So if he's going to be with her, he has to do something which he finds horrific. He has to act. 
So he gets the part of Benvolio in this youth theatre production. Now, I was the kind of kid that loved being in youth theatre productions. Youth theatre was really important to me, uh, and school productions and university productions. I found that experience really exciting, romantic, intense, dramatic, full of self-inflicted you know, melodrama and, and, and I want to try and get that on the page. But it's, much, it's very hard to write that from an insider's point of view. It's much better to write from the point of view of someone who's a bit skeptical. So in many ways, Charlie's kind of the opposite of me. You know, he, he d d doesn't do very well at school. I was a very, I went to a, the same kind of school as Charlie, quite a kind of tough, comprehensive and uh, but I was very doggedly um, swatty, you know, I was kind of bookish. I was the kind of kid that Charlie would have taken dinner money off. You know, I was, I was not in Charlie's gang. And, um, and uh, yeah, Charlie hates the idea of performance. And I was a, you know, big amateur actor. He, he hates the idea of Shakespeare. And I loved Shakespeare as soon as I encountered him. So again, you, you're writing away from yourself at the same time. I remember the intensity of the experience, the intensity of the friendships and the sensation of first love. And I didn't have as happy a time as Charlie, but I, uh, I remember what all of that felt like with that. So there's no diary. Um, it just was a, a turning point in my life, really going from school to sit from college that summer, that particular time was almost as big a transition for me as going to university. So it came very easily. So of course I'm much much older than Charlie as well. I mean I was 16 in 1983 and I didn't want to write another 80s novel so it's set in 97 but it turns out that being 16 in the 90s is broadly the same as being 16 in the 80s. Okay okay fascinating. Now Emotion you write so well about this um and about sex, you say in Sweet Sorry that what I thought was just a most wonderful line that sex is like making pancakes. It resonate with cooks as well as other people out there. The first one is terrible, but you get better. Now, that was so brilliant. How do you sort of get in the zone? There's also a lot of dialogue, which is very well done. But, you know, the way you write about emotion is, is fantastic and quite unusual amongst male writers. Am I going to get vilified for this? But several people said to me, oh, he's so good. God, he, you know. He writes about emotion so well. Now, why shouldn't a man write well about emotion? So I don't really know how I can ask this, but, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's it's very, very good. And I just wondered. Well, I, I, mean, I think, well, I mean, I'm glad you, you like that scene. I was very nervous about it because when I wrote Us, that one of the reviewers said, um, no one reads a David Nichols novel for the sex. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Oh, it's true. I am a, you know, I'm a kind of tend to fade to black. I don't really want to write, you know, write that, write what you know. <laughs> I don't really want to go there. Uh, but with this novel, if you're writing about 16 year olds, you know, it's everywhere. You have to, you have to kind of go for it. So I, so there is a kind of awkward, broadly comedic, but hopefully not overly comedic sex scene. I just, uh, I, I just, just is what I want to write about, you know, the, the, the awkwardness and the excitement of emotions and relationships. I, 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 I never thought that it wasn't natural material. Uh, I would be, there are lots of things I, I can't write, you know, and I, I, would, I would avoid and, and, and probably I should be a bit bolder and braver and write a little bit more outside uh, of my own experiences and, uh, and, and perhaps push the boundaries a little bit. But I, I don't know if there's any point in me writing a, a horror novel or a war novel or a science fiction novel, even though I quite enjoy all those genres. Um, I, uh, my natural voice, I suppose, is to look in detail at relationships between uh, between people. And, and when I started writing, it was often romantic relationships. And as I've got older, it's more and more family relationships. I think you know, something I probably can't do anymore, something I, 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 I would be nervous about is writing about dating or, or, or that kind of 30 something, 20 something relationships in the modern age. I, I'd need to do a little bit of thinking and some research and talk to people about it because it's changed so much. But that aside, you know, that it, it's, it's just what I'm, I, I'm drawn to. Um, I've tried to stretch things. What I love about adapting other people's work is it does, it's a way of um, broadening your own horizons and, 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 and pushing your own voice into 
into material that you wouldn't necessarily um, write about naturally. I mean, I think I'm very proud of the portrayal of addiction and recovery in Patrick Melrose. And it's, it, it is, I'm only able to write about it. And I do write, you know, scenes and dialogue that aren't in the original novels, but the original novel kind of gives you a leg up into worlds that you don't necessarily occupy uh, either as your own writer or in your own life. And so I'm grateful for the kind of courage and range that I've extracted from, from the other writers that I've, I've had the pleasure of adapting. Um, and, you know, the next book will be interesting because I am going to have to find something new to write about. I am going to have to broaden my horizons. I'm not quite sure I'm going to do that yet, but that's my intention. And I think your wife is, is, is a screenwriter. Who's your first reader? Do, do, do she read your, does she read them before anyone else? Or? She's, um, she's, we're not married. She's my partner and she, she was a script editor and now she's, an, uh, now she's a very brilliant uh, academic art, art historian. Okay. Uh, and uh, she, I don't give it to her until I think it's good, because it's quite embarrassing to, you know, <laughs> if you hand over something that's a real dog, and then they have to sit opposite you at breakfast. You know, I want it to be polished. I want it. I want a little bit of reassurance that it, she isn't going to think less of me. She's a very brilliant editor, and but a very tough editor, a very critical editor. So I have to give it a give it a, a, a shine before it, it gets to her. But the first draft uh, goes to Johnny, my agent, and when he gives the go ahead, it goes to Nick, my editor, and two or three other trusted readers and friends who I, whose opinions I listen to a lot. And then and, and Hannah's one of those. But with a script, you know, as soon as you send it off, it goes to 15 people and everyone just weighs in and gives you hundreds of notes. But with a novel, you have a little bit more, you have, you know, you're the novelist, you have a bit more control and a bit more say. I, so I do take notes with novels uh, and, and I do a lot of rewriting, but not nearly as much as I do with the script. Oh, interesting, okay, okay. Um, and I, yeah, okay. So, um, sorry. Uh, oh, now, yes, you adapting your own work. Yeah. That's very interesting. You, I think you've made the decision to adapt all your own work. Now, I wanted to ask you why don't take the money and run, but I think maybe you've maybe you've answered all that because you, you have a background in that, but... Um... It is tempting to, and I, I have wanted to, but it turns out that it's, it's harder to see someone else adapt it than it is to adapt it yourself. And I'm also not... I'm not uh, dogmatic about it. You know, I don't, there's no point just transcribing a novel page by page. So I, I'm, I'm um, able, I think, to tell to a certain degree what will and won't work on screen and what will or won't sound okay coming from an actor's mouth and what will or won't be funny. And I have made lots of mistakes in that respect. You know, I, I have often insisted on scenes being um, carried over from the novel exactly as written and it turns out that they don't work on screen they're not funny they're they're not funny because they lack a narrative voice or a, an irony or a piece of description so i have got my fingers burned quite often but generally speaking i'm i'm okay with things being cut and changed and rewritten and us you know on tv was both pretty faithful but also page by page wildly different you know it's it, you can you can do both you can capture the essence and the spirit of a, a book without slavishly sticking to the dialogue and the events described um so that's why also why i like to be involved and why now you know also i get to go to the edit i get to have a, a say on things like music and uh i i'm casting and design so i i, I feel now a little bit more in control so i'm i I, I have no inclination to to run away. I, I, I like it. Okay, okay. I mean, it's painful, it's horrible as well. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also ex exciting. You know, if you can accept that things are gonna change then, then um, and you can change them as well, as skillfully as possible, uh, then it's good to be involved. Okay, okay. So, um, just moving on to lockdown, how, yeah. Um, your, yeah, the dreaded word, how how has your lockdown been and have you written much? Have you found that sort no, of... No, no, I haven't. I, I thought that I would, um, I, 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 uh, I haven't. I was going to, I've done one thing, which is I'm trying to write the screen version of Sweet Sorrow because, you know, 
when I was thinking of the novel, I was thinking of The 400 Blows and Gregory's Girl and all of these wonderful coming of age films that were an influence on the book. And I suppose I'm kind of reverse engineering it now and trying to think how it could work as a, as a sunny, funny, sad coming of age film. So I'm, I'm working on that. But I was also hoping to write some new fiction and I haven't been able to do that because a lot of my novels, the last three novels, the kind of informal trilogy of One Day and Us and Sweet Sorrow, they all, they're all about changes over 20, 25 years. They're all about how we change and how we stay the same. And put together, they're a kind of portrait of how love is different from the age of 16 to the age of 56. You know, it's about love throughout our lives and how we change as we get older. And I can't write about that anymore. You know, I have to write something contemporary, something here and now. And just the moment I sat down to write about the here and now, the here and now changed, you know, it evaporated. It became something completely different. So it seemed to me the wise thing to do was just to kind of sit it out and, and, and watch and observe. Um, so I, I haven't written any fiction for a while. I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to do a little bit less adaptation and a little bit more creation. I love adaptation, but there's always a slight feeling for me that you're copying someone else's homework and that you need to really do it yourself and that's what I will do next but I, I, I've I, been like a lot of writers I think sent into a bit of a spin uh, by what's happening. I don't want to write anything nostalgic and I don't want to write anything said in 2019 yeah. but I don't know what 2021 is going to be so what can you do? Yeah 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 absolutely and does it does it does it work the feeling of sort of being, do you get claustrophobic? Do you not like being confined yeah. like that? Or? I, 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 I've been very happy to be, to spend more time with the kids and, and supervise things. I mean, Hannah's been working and I've been kind of doing the homeschooling and that's been, that's been good. Uh, I miss not being able to get out of the city. I love walking and I, I, I'm very sad about not being able to do any of that. But um, I, I do hate not writing. I really hate it. I, I, I um, it, it makes me feel anxious, I think, and and uh, I'm just getting back into it now. It's easier. My my professional life, my working life, is built around term times, and when the schools closed, it was impossible, and that was fine. But now I need to knuckle down. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, books. What obviously this talk is for a, a, a for Book Aid, a, mm -hmm. a, a charity that supplies books all over the world. What um, what have been your what three books would you recommend to our readers, and what sort of brought you a lot of comfort in, in lockdown? What a good question. Uh, uh, now let me think. Well, I just read a wonderful um, a wonderful book. I wonder if I have it here. Bear with me. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. But I have something else by her. Uh, I, I've been reading a lot of the American writer Mary Gateskill and a, a very slim book called Lost Cat, which was amazing. And you could read it in an hour, 80 pages, uh, a, a memoir about, um, well, it starts with the loss of a cat and becomes about parenthood and family and class and all kinds of things. I thought that was a fantastic book. Uh, something else I have here. Uh, this doesn't come out till next year. This is called Luster. Uh, this is by an American writer called Raven Leilani. And it's, uh, a very uh, darkly funny, wicked story of a kind of uh, of a, an adulterous affair that takes in issues again of class and race, and is 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 really provocative and funny and shocking, and and that was fantastic. And I suppose I should think of something more um, comforting. What have I turned to for comfort? Uh, I have. Um, uh, I thought, I tell you what I did. I, I thought, well, I've got to fill in all the gaps of my reading knowledge now. I'm going to read Anna Karenina now and D.H. Lawrence. I've never read, read a D.H. Lawrence novel. How can you not have read a D.H. Lawrence novel? So I picked up Women in Love and the first day I read 100 pages and the, the second day I read 50 pages and the third day I was down to 20. <laughs> and then I had to give up. I, I found it completely uh, impossible to get through. Uh, but I have been reading a lot of short stories. So who do I love as a great short story writer? Laurie Moore is a really wonderful short story writer. And John Cheever. I think if I'm stuck on my own fiction, often picking up a short story, reading uh, just a little slice of life, a little vignette, uh, can often 
a bit spur your own imagination and, and, and give you ideas for themes and situations. So I've been reading a lot of short stories. Okay. Fantastic. That's that's lovely. That's always that part of it's always very popular with our, our readers. Um and just lastly, because I'm aware of mm. the time, um we heard from the inspirational Paul Boating earlier, who spoke about the power of books and the amazing work Book Aid are doing to ensure people in some of the poorest parts of the world have access to brand new books. What kind of sort of quite a general question? What what book what do books bring to your life? Can you imagine a world without books? Uh, no, I would find it very uh, very difficult. I mean, it's sort of my certainly my childhood revolved completely around books and the television. Uh, uh, often books in front of the television, but the the local library was a you know a refuge and an escape, and uh, uh, I was uh, obsessive about it and spent two or three or four evenings a week there. So for me, it was transformative, and I'm, I'm sure that even in a digital age, that's still happening, not just here but around the world. Um, so um, yeah, for me, uh, books have been completely life changing, not just because you know. I, I write, but just because of the, uh, the, 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 the escapism and the solace and the wisdom and the knowledge that they, they, they provide and the, the sense of empathy too, the sense that, that actually these feelings which are painful and troubling and, and, and seem um, uh, uh, unchangeable are, are, are not unique, that, you know, that, that experience of reading a passage in a book and thinking, yes I know exactly what that's like that's very very precious and so I can't imagine living without that okay that's wonderful well thank you so much David that was fantastic I could actually I've got so many more questions I'd like to ask you but I must <laughs> and not be selfish and not hog you um now the very wonderful I owner at Bookhead is actually going to whatsapp them to me because okay. otherwise up in front of you and I can't see so our first question, um, Olivia asks, um, I left university the day, the year, sorry, one day came out. And mm. I, remember, I remember exactly where I was when Emma died. I have not done this with any other book. Did you know when you wrote that bit, what an impact it would have? And in fact, several, yes, I've got several similar questions about that. Um, I, uh, did I have an impact? No, I mean, Absolutely not. It would have been very hard to write if I'd had any anticipation of how it was going to be received. I just did write it with a lot of fondness and, and, and pleasure. And, you know, I loved Emma. I loved writing Emma. And, and she was, um, you know, I was sort of in all of, where, all of the locations where Emma and Dexter are on the 15th of July through all those years. I was either there or nearby. So Emma and Dexter spend their first night together in Rankela Street in Edinburgh in, in 1985. And I was in Edinburgh that summer putting on a, you know, a play in the Fringe. So I kind of knew, uh, I was, with the year that Emma was doing the kind of um, the bad uh, theatre and education show, that's what I was doing. And the year that she goes abroad for the first time, I went abroad for the first time. And so even though, uh, it wasn't entirely autobiographical. There was a kind of a link between me and the characters, and particularly Emma. And so I, there was a lot of pleasure in writing it. I really loved writing it. I wrote the whole thing once and I printed it out and I put it by my side and then I wrote it again from scratch. I didn't word script, I didn't, um, uh, you know, word process it. I, I wrote it again and just polished it again and again and again until it was, you know, to a high sheen. And I do that with everything I've written, but I've never enjoyed it the way I quite enjoy doing it with one day. And, um, and the first few responses I got were much more powerful than any, you know, much more passionate than anything else I'd ever submitted to a reader. So it was, it was exciting. But um, no, I had no sense that it would, it would affect people in that way, no. no. That's amazing. That's incredible to write it all again um right ben says david hello if you could have a glass of wine with one this is an interesting question with one of the characters in your books who would you choose and why well you know that's an interesting question because quite often um i love 
talking to readers and and uh, doing book events. And the only time, it's not just me, the only time an author, you can slightly see their shoulders rise is when someone says, um, I didn't find the characters very likable. Because, um, uh, and, and I know Ben isn't saying anything remotely like that, but, but a character isn't necessarily a friend. And quite often the demands of story mean that they've got to be the opposite of friends. They've got to be maddening. You know, they've got to be, they've got to do foolish things. They've got to do mean things. They've got to do things that are, that are, that are, that are objectionable. Otherwise there's no, no story. You know, it's very hard to write about well-behaved, sensible, well-balanced people. So um, for that reason, there aren't many, you know, Douglas would send me crazy. Was he? If I met him when I was uh, his age, would probably beat me up. Um, uh, the one who uh, I feel warmest, the, have the warmest feelings for is, is Emma, you know, is Emma Morley in One Day, because, but even she is, you know, sometimes pompous and self-righteous and, and aloof and, you know, she's, she sometimes can be a bit callous to people and a bit judgmental and, and um, you know, we're not, we're not the same in that respect. But if I had to spend, I could imagine seeing, yeah, spending time with Emma. But, I, but we would, you know, go home furious with each other, as friends sometimes do. Oh, okay, that's a good answer. Okay, now this is from Caroline. In lockdown, you did a great service on Twitter holding virtual launch parties uh, yeah. for authors with books coming out. What gave you that idea? It was great, by the way, for writers and booksellers as well as readers. I guess she's one of those, maybe a bookseller, I don't know. But anyway. Uh, thank you. I mean, it was really, it was the only useful thing I could write. <laughs> it was the most useful thing I could do, given that I couldn't put anything original down of my own. I was, I suppose, aware of how exciting it is to, to publish your first book in particular, but to have a book out there and how tough it must have been for writers who work for years and years and years on, on, on their books and overcome all these hurdles um, for the shop doors to close just at the point their books were, were hitting the shelves. And that must have been really tough. And I think, uh, you know, I hope that a lot of books that didn't quite get the attention they deserve will, will you know, have a long life and will, whether they come out in paperback or word of mouth, they will they, they will find their readership. But it just seemed to me particularly tough. So it was a, a, a small gesture of celebration, really, because um, the opportunity not just to, to have a book launch party, but to do festivals and to get to speak about your work in public and, and share your ideas, all of that was suddenly snatched away. And, and I was aware of, you know, in a small way, Sweet Sorrow suffered, but I was very lucky to have you know, an established readership and for it not to be a first novel and, and to have a certain amount of security behind me. So uh, I just felt uh, for, for anyone who was just starting out. So it was, a, it was a, um, an attempt to celebrate books of all kinds. I mean, that was the other thing. I didn't editorialize the lists at all. It wasn't kind of hot you know uh, novels that would have had a lot of publicity anyway it was anyone who wrote to me so I learned a lot myself about publishing about the extraordinary range of books out there and authors and and it was great to celebrate that so it was just a small weekly celebration that was as much about acknowledging the writer's uh, achievements as it was about selling books in large quantities. Oh, that's a very, very generous thing to do. Rebecca asked, when you create your characters, do you borrow traits from people you know? And do you tell them they were the inspiration of the character, for the character? Um, no, I'm quite good about that. I'm quite strict about it. I've never written, um, you know, anything vengeful. <laughs> I've never settled the score. I didn't think, I think there was, there was maybe a tiny one character in, in Start of a Ten who was, who was based on someone who then read it and, didn't pick it pick up on it no I'm quite good about um writing away from real life yeah but inevitably you know if I if I borrow someone's anecdote I do ask their permission I do tell them so if I'm if I'm closely following something that happens to someone in real life it would be crazy it would be very impolite not to not to just say I hope you don't mind mm. and there are a couple of those in in one day the the, the game with um 
where Dexter goes to his in-laws and, and plays that game with the roll of newspaper. That was from, from someone's own experience. And uh, generally speaking, if it's excruciating, it's something that I've done. Uh, but if someone <laughs> gives me a particularly good story, then I, I will use it, but I will ask their permission. Yeah. Okay, okay fine. Um, now somebody's picked up on... Uh, oh, that's right. Okay, Laura, sorry, um, I'm also being told, please do ask a question. If you want to be anonymous, that's absolutely fine. I am reading out people's yeah. names, but you do ask something anonymously. Laura said, I never made the link between tests and the concept of one day. Are there any other links between classical literature and your writing you could mention? Uh, yeah, and often they're very, I mean, I have it in my head when I'm writing a book, I have a little list of kind of, um, uh, not quite inspirations, but, but books that I want to draw from, not just books either, books and films that I want to draw from. So I take a lot from Great Expectations. Awesome. You know, the, the, there's a lot of Pip and Estella in Start of a Ten. Um, there's a, a, a lot of the kind of awkward fondness um, between Pip and Joe Gargery in a couple of my books. Uh, I, 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 Great Expectations is sprinkled through all of them, really. Um, Billy Lyre, uh, with Sweet Sorrow, I thought a lot about um, The Go-Between and a Philip Roth novel called uh, Goodbye Columbus, a novella by Philip Roth, which I love. The reason she's called Fran in Sweet Sorrow is because of Franny and Zooey by Salinger. I love J.D. Salinger. He's, a, he's someone I draw on a lot, particularly in the way he portrays the kind of the idealism and self-righteousness of youth. Uh, I think that's a, a good touchstone. So that that they're they're sort of that's a whole range of touchstones. Um, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, I think about a lot. You know, I love Scott Fitzgerald's lyricism and also his cynicism. You know, he's this terrific mix of of of, of they sort of they look like love stories, but they're also full of disappointment and regret and sadness. So I've drawn on you know, when I was writing us, I thought a lot about Tender as the Night. I thought a lot about um, John Cheever's short stories, which are often about slightly buttoned up um, uh, kind of mid-ranking bureaucrats who lead tortured emotional lives and never uh, and have secret passions. So Cheever was there. Um, yeah, I, I think um, Far From the Madding Crowd, you know, if you look at Far From the Madding Crowd, it's a classic romantic comedy. It's a woman who has to choose between uh, friendship, sex and status and what she going to choose. That's something that those kinds of decisions I draw on all the time, you know, those kinds of scenarios, those kind of setups, very classic romantic comedy setups like Much Ado About Nothing or Pride and Prejudice, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all rich material and inspiration for me. Yeah, yeah there are lots. Okay, well, that's, that was a wonderful array, wonderful banquet. Um, Grace wants to know how you cope with writer's block and a co overcoming that annoying voice that tells you your writing is no good? Well, I certainly hear that voice and, and uh, in some ways it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful voice because there isn't anything I've ever written that I know I couldn't make better and, and, and I don't, I, I would I would keep going if I could you know I would I would reshoot scenes and take books off the shelf and <laughs> rewrite take out bad jokes I'd love to do that so the voice that says how are you going to make this better is good the voice that says this is useless don't ever show it to anyone is bad and you have to find a middle way between the two because you know the, the, the one writes to be read and and uh, at some point it, it's important and healthy to share and get feedback, to get responses. Um, in my experience, you know, good notes really do help. And, and, and uh, I suppose the only thing I'd say about that is I, I try now not to give work to anyone else to read until that voice has got a little quieter. Mm -hmm. You know, the voice that says this is embarrassing. I, I, I have to make it as good as I possibly can by myself before I'll give it to someone else to improve it further. So um, I think the other thing I would say about that in a practical writing way is it's very healthy and it's very helpful to turn yourself from the writer to a reader. Uh, in other words, to look at your own work objectively and with a clear head. And one way of doing that is time. You know, the longer you can give yourself between writing something and reviewing it, the better, because you will, 
you will um, lose both the pain and the excitement of the writing process and uh, approach it with a little bit more objectivity. And, um, and so I try and do that. If I think something is really bad, uh, you can just put it away for a little while and go back to it and then have another look because you might be surprised. If it's still really bad, no one's going to publish it without your permission and you can just get rid of it, throw it away. Do you read your reviews when they come out or do you throw them away and then come down at midnight and pull them out of the way so it feels good? I don't read them uh, because and I don't, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't read the good ones or the bad ones because they're not for me. You know, they're not for, um, they're, 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 they're for the reader. And, and also I find, I find bad ones, there's no point denying it. I mean, I find bad ones excruciating. I find them deeply personal. You know, that whole thing, it's, you know, it's not you, it's the work. Well, I put a lot into the work and the work is a reflection of me and, you know, what I, um, and what I've tried to achieve. So if someone tells you you failed in that ambition, it's really hard. So I don't seek them out. And of course, as you can tell from what I'm saying, it kind of, it does get back to you. You find out in roundabout ways. Someone will phone up and say, don't buy the Times today. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's as bad as 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 you know reading it the, the first review for sweet sorrow was a real stinker in the times and it was a long way ahead of the other reviews and i thought well this is going to be a disaster and i didn't i didn't uh, read it but i was told not to because it was personal and and it and unfair and that's what i was told anyway i'm sure it's a perfectly fair response but i know it would have broken my heart and so i've never read it but I still have, you know, I still feel terrible about it without knowing what it says. But thankfully, everything that came after was really, really good. And I knew in my heart of hearts that it was the best thing I'd ever written. And uh, as long as I can hold on to that, then that's fine. But it is hard. It is really hard. Bad reviews. And especially on the Internet now, because uh, it's much, much harder to hide from them. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm always being copied into slightly painful personal not pain not personal but tough critiques um so if any of you are on social media don't do that <laughs> someone the other day tweeted me saying hey look i've just found this terrible review of one day and i thought well i mean i don't find it funny it's really horrible it's really hard and i wrote it 10 years ago there's nothing i can do about it you know it's done now uh, and I didn't, I, I was much happier not knowing it was there. Yeah. So um, I muted that person. <laughs> <laughs> Very sensible. Very sensible. Um, now, I'm aware of time, but I just want to yeah. ask, can I just ask you one last question? Um, this is an anonymous one. Okay. I loved Sweet Sorrow. It was a very moving and uplifting book. I wanted to know what advice you would give to someone seeking to write nostalgic fiction. That's interesting. I mean, I I feel a bit ambiguous about the word nostalgia because I was reading the other day, I forget where I read this, but someone pointed out that nostalgia, that the alga bit of nostalgia means pain. You know, it's like neuralgia. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, and, and, and nos means home. So it's the pain of home. And uh, in other words, that it's a it's a it's a negative feeling. It's it's a feeling of homesickness and 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 loss. And um, and yet often when we use nostalgia now, we we mean, you know, things being better in the past. Mm. Sweet Sorrow, I wanted to be quite honest about how horrible it can be at that age. You know, how lonely you can feel, how isolated and confused you could feel. So it's nostalgic and it, it, the, nostal the word nostalgia is double edged. You know, it's sweet and it's sorrowful. Uh, that's w why the novel has that name. Um, so uh, I think being able to, how can I answer this? I, I, I think a sense of regret and loss and melancholy is shot through all of, all of the things I've written, but it's particularly strong in Sweet Sorrow. And that I think is why I like it the most. I'm not nostalgic for the past in the sense that I want to go back there, but I do feel rueful about it and um, quite sad about it as well as missing elements of it. And so I think maybe it's that combination I think it's the combination of, um, of yeah, of bitterness and sweetness uh, that, that for me uh, is tied up with the word nostalgia. 
it's a it's a it's a very strange sensation, a hard thing to distill. Um, I suppose a practical. I'm not sure if this is answering the question. A practical way of approaching it, I think, is not to overdo it. Often, when people write about the past, they they you know every time, sometimes on the radio, it's a it's a news event or a song from that year, and everyone's wearing exactly what everyone wore. Well, actually, in 1997, I was listening to music from 1973. You know, it's not as simple as that. It's an, often when we're in a moment, we're not living the moment all the time. Perhaps that's what's so alarming about 2020. 2020 feels like a very unique, particular, specific feeling, and it's unique in that respect. But usually we go through our lives without thinking, hey, I'm in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're writing about it, don't overdo it. Yeah. Good advice, good writing advice. David, that was absolutely lovely. I so enjoyed that. Thank you very, very much. And I'm sure all our, our um, watchers did as well. Thank you so much for giving up the time. It's a pleasure. And, Thank you all for uh, coming. Thank you. No, well, uh, that was really, really fantastic. And um, good luck with the, the adaptation of Sweet Sorrow. I look forward to seeing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It was very nice to, for everyone to come along. Thank you. <laughs>